gonna be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I wanna be a producer. Hello, everyone. This is Ken Davenport, and welcome to the Producer's Perspective podcast, episode number four. On the first three episodes of the podcast, we sat down with three folks who sit on the administrative side of Broadway. For today's podcast, we're sitting down with someone on the opposite side of the table, uh, the creative side, to get his perspective on all things Broadway. And I'm honored that the table I'm sitting at, literally, is actually the table of none other than multiple Tony Award winner, Emmy Award winner, Drama Desk Award winner, Theater Hall of Famer, Terrence McNally. Welcome, Terrence. Hi. Terrence is the writer of such plays and musicals as Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune, Lips Together, Teeth Apart, Love, Valor, Compassion, Masterclass, Mothers and Sons, Kiss of the Spider Woman, A Full Monty, and of course, this year's biggest hit, which I am fortunate enough to be a producer on, It's Only a Play. And it was just announced that the long gestating The Visit, which uh, Terrence has wrote the book for, will make its debut on Broadway this spring at the Lyceum Theater. Terrence has also written operas, screenplays, teleplays, and a whole lot more. So... Terrence, my first question to you is, you have to be one of the most prolific playwrights around. Can you tell me a little bit about your process? How how long does it go for you to get an idea to do something to have a completed script? Well, very often it's a long time from an idea, like, oh, there's a play here, to me actually sitting down at the keyboard and beginning to write it. So, uh, and it's been a different experience with ever every single play I've written. Basically, I like deadlines. Uh, you know, in a musical, you have collaborators, and you have meetings weekly, and so you have to have a certain amount done by Monday at four when you're gonna meet with Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty, who are working on a project. When you're on your own, you're your own boss, and as I said, you get an idea, and you say, there's a play here, and maybe a year later, two years later, uh, I got the idea for Frankie and Johnny, took a trip to India, and came back and wrote a, 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 two or three plays before I wrote Frankie and Johnny, and then I wrote A Perfect Ganesh, which is a play about going to India, five years after that. So there's no real cause and effect. I'm just grateful when they come, and when they come, they. I think what I've learned is not to turn on the computer until I'm ready to begin writing. I don't enjoy staring at a blank screen, so I wait till it's really time to go, you know. And it's, it's sort of figure out where to begin the play is part of the challenge. You sort of, before you start to write a play, you know the general story you want to tell, but where do you begin? And I, that's a really important decision to make, when, when to start. Yeah, I've heard some writers say, oh, I, I know how this is going to end, or I have the final scene in mind, but is, for, so for you it's more of the beginning? Or? It's more the beginning, the situation. Masterclass is a play I knew how it was going to begin and end, but I had no idea what would be in the middle. I always knew the first line would be a no applause. The day I got the idea for writing a play about Maria Collis, teaching a masterclass for Zoe Caldwell, uh, in a second I got no applause, and the last line of the play, well, that's that. Then I had to write the play. <laughs> uh, and uh, there was a playwriting festival in Big Fork, Montana. And he said, do you have something? And I said, yeah, I have something. And so they gave me a date, so that's why I said deadlines work well, too. So I had to have something done by March 15th of that year because I told them in October, say, that I had, would have a play for them. So... Uh, uh, I, I don't just sit at an a, a empty keyboard and think, ooh, what should I write about? No, no. New York is a very uh, stimulating city. I, I've never been at a loss for ideas. It's more finding time, you know, uh, having a play in production and in rehearsal. It's pretty hard to do something else. You get very focused on that. And so I'm now beginning to get back to some other projects that were put aside because of it's only a play happily. Uh, because uh, that's been a great experience, but I, I won't pretend I go to rehearsals if it's only a play and come home and work on a new play. No, that's all I do. So tell me a little bit about how you got your start, why you decided to be a playwright, and what was the early process like of you getting into this business? Uh, I always wanted to be a writer. Um, I figured I'd probably be a journalist. 
I came to New York at 17 and went to Columbia. I went to the theater a lot. Uh, I'd seen a couple of shows as a young child uh, and they made big impressions on me. So I, was, I loved theater. From the time I was five or six years old, I didn't see very much of it growing up in Corpus Christi, Texas. But I knew New York, Broadway, that's a good reason to go to Columbia. Uh, and the first night I was in New York, I went right to Times Square and uh, found my way to the Mark Hellinger Theater and asked to see My Fair Lady. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And they said, it's totally sold out for the next six months. I said, oh, well, what do you do if you want to see it sooner than that? They said, well, there's a line, Standy's, a dollar. There's like 18 place, standing room places. They go on sale at 10 a.m. So uh, if you want one of them, you better be in line by midnight because the line is totally, there's 18 people in line by midnight. And uh, it, that's the only way you'll get in. So I wandered a few blocks south and there at the 46th Street Theater was a big marquee. It said Gwen Verdon and Damn Yankees. So I saw that my first night in New York. I went back to the Mark Hellinger Theater. There was about three people there already. And we were sitting, we were sitting on the sidewalk actually when My Fair Lady ended because the shows began at 8.40 in 1956. And My Fair Lady is fairly lengthy show. So it was like 11.15, 11.30. And people were coming out and they say, you guys are going to sit there all night to get standing room for this show? We said, yeah. They acted like we were crazy. And of course I thought, oh, they're just rich. They're so lucky they can afford to buy a seat. And I met several people. It was fun talking. That was my first night in New York, having seen Gwen Verdon, uh, sitting outside the Mark Hellinger Theater. The box office opened promptly at 10. And those 18 places were gone by 10.01, cost a dollar, so the guy just gave him a dollar bill. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Happened really fast, the line was gone. And I slept my way through my first day of freshman week in Columbia, but I did see My Fair Lady my second night in New York. And then during the run of the play before the original cast left, I saw it 11 more times. So I guess I was stage struck. <laughs> I still didn't think I was going to be a writer. That was seeing a musical. And I, you know, I heard the album in Corpus Christi. And it was a glorious show. I mean, uh, pretty hard to describe how amazing the original My Fair Lady was. It was the first time, I think, people saw turntables and elaborate costumes. It was so extravagant. And um, I just started going to the theater and the opera a lot. And I always thought I'd go to Columbia School of Journalism across the campus after four years. And while I was at Columbia, uh, I, I read that they didn't have anyone to write the Varsity Show. And I thought, well, I could write and try it. And I wrote that with Ed Kleban, who wrote the music and lyrics. He was in my class. And I sort of enjoyed that. Then when I graduated from Columbia, I got a, a prize to go off and be creative. It seemed like a lot of money at the time. I think it was about $5,000. And I went to Mexico, and I was going to write a, a great novel. And while I was there, I just started writing a play. And uh, I sent it to the Actors Studio in New York, the Playwrights Unit. And Molly Kazan, who ran it, she was the wife of Elia Kazan, wrote me this letter. I was living in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, when it was a really unknown little spot with two flights a week that landed in a cornfield. Uh, she said, if you get back to New York, I'd love to talk to you. You don't seem to have a lot of stage experience from some of your stage directions. You should hang out with actors and directors and see how plays are really put together. And I thought, sounds good. So uh, I got nowhere with the novel. I maybe wrote 60 pages of it. And uh, while I was there, as I said, I wrote this, I'd written this play and I continued working on that. Got back to New York, worked as the stage manager at Actor Studio. So I was in the presence of great directors, great actors, great playwrights, and the playwrights unit was in its halcyon days then. And um, they did my play uh, one afternoon, and uh, someone there from the Rockefeller Foundation saw it, and they were commissioning new plays to be done at the Guthrie Theater, and my first play got done at the Guthrie. People saw it, and then it went to Broadway. I mean. 
this kind of story does not happen anymore. No one's first play they ever wrote gets done on Broadway. Now, the first play I ever wrote and gets done on Broadway was a big fat flop, and it took me maybe 20 years to have a sense of humor about that and write it's only a play. And then it took, it's taken another 20 years to get that play onto Broadway, where it probably always belonged, and happily it's very successful now. But that's sort of, I sort of fell into it. Uh, I never had a vocational epiphany, like, I want to be a playwright. It was more, oh, I guess I'm earning a living as a playwright. Mm. But I've always earned a living as a writer. And while you were coming up uh, and around that company of actors and directors, which I, I love, I, th I give a lot of people the same advice, you should surround yourself with other artists. Your contemporary, your peers. So my first play was a big flop, as I said. I went back to journalism and was working as an editor for a magazine, finding it very hard at the end of the day to come back to my apartment and write my own work, a play. And I'd become friends with a character actor named James Coco, and uh, he said, I'll never be a star. And I thought he was a wonderfully comic, great actor. I said, well, I said, no one writes leading roles for fat character actors, no. I get to come in in the second act and have a scene, or maybe have a short scene in the first scene and a better scene in the second act, but I don't really have plays written about me. So I said, I'll write a play for you, and I wrote this play called Next. And he said, great, I love it, but who's going to want to do a play with me? No one knows who James Coco is. So dissolved to uh, less than a year later. He's up in summer stock at uh, Berkshire Theatre Festival. I'm still at this magazine. And then the next play, he was in a play by Elaine May. And the play that was going to follow them at the Berkshire Theatre Festival got canceled. So suddenly they needed a play overnight. Jimmy said, I have a play. And they read it and liked it. He gave it to Elaine. She read it and said, I want to direct it. Jimmy calls me. Uh, within a day, I'm on a bus going to Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And we did Next. And I've earned a living as a playwright ever since. And that was in about 1965 or so. So I've been very lucky. And so, you know, there is talent, sure. There is luck. But you got to be prepared when the moment happens. I mean, if he said, can you write a play for me tonight, overnight? I'll give it to Elaine in the morning. I probably could not have written the play overnight, but it was ready to go. And it was a great experience working with Elaine. And that, but that's the basic story of my career. And suddenly I, I was like earning a living writing plays. And I loved it. Any advice from people around at the time as, the, as you burst on the scene? Any uh, mentors that, um, that you worked well, with? My, oh, advice? Um, from anyone that said, this is how you're well, going to... My advice I would give people is what I did. Hang out with really talented people. You know, I think standing outside the stage door, hoping Nathan Lane is going to want to do your play and you slip him a copy, probably won't even take it from you or he may not even go out the stage door and make one of his phantom exits from the basement. But when I, when Nathan Lane did the Lisbon Traviata, I had seen him in many things and thought he was the most amazing young comic actor, frankly, since Jimmy Coco. And Nathan Lane was not Nathan Lane when he did the Lisbon Traviata. So I'd be realistic, and there are so many good young theater companies in New York. And that's where you should hang out, not... Most off-Broadway theater companies now, not-for-profits, are not entry-level theaters anymore. Manhattan Theater Club, Playwrights Horizon, they, they kind of have their writers. And it takes a while to get to their attention. It's changed. It was, it was relatively easy to get a play done off-Broadway in the 60s. I mean, it really felt as if we finished them on Friday, cast them on Monday and went into rehearsal the following Friday. It just was bang, bang, bang. Now I know production costs have risen, but there's just been a slowing down of the process. There are fewer, off-Broadway has pretty much died. There were so many small theaters, and everyone seemed to be able to earn a living at a 99-seat theater, or 199-seat theater. Next ran at a theater that's long gone on 13th Street, and the big uh, flaw in that theater was you couldn't play on Friday night because it was uh, served a purpose as a synagogue. So 
you know, a lot of the commercial brews say, what can you do with that Friday night? So we had four show weekends. But everyone seemed to be able to make that work. And now it's, if you're not done by the public or Manhattan Theater Club or Playwrights Horizon, it's kind of hard, Atlantic, there are a few groups. But there are all these newer groups, which are almost off-off-Broadway, that are welcoming to new writers, directors, and actors. And that's, my, my advice is hang out with your peers. Hang out with your peers. Uh, the odds of your first play going to Broadway in this day and age are pretty remote. I mean, yes, anything can happen, but you should be with your peers anyway and learn from one another. And the other bit of advice is always be try to work with people who are smarter and more talented than you so you learn something. If you're the smartest person in the room, you tend not to learn anything. So uh, challenge yourself. It's fantastic advice about n not being the smartest person in the room. Uh, there seems to be, look, you've always been very active, obviously, um, but there seems to be a lot of activity with both revivals of some of your earlier works and new stuff as well. Um, in the last year, Mothers and Sons, Away We Go, only a play, just the last 12 months. Now here comes The Visit again. Mm -hmm. it's, and I'm hearing rumblings about some more revivals, and I'm sure you mentioned at the beginning of this, you're working on something new. Yeah. yeah. There seems to be a lot of... McNally activity or, or heat around you. Is, do you? Why do you think there's a reason why all of a sudden there's even? No, a I mean I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> You'll take it, but I'll, I'll take it. Uh, but I, I I do think a, a lot of of things that happen in life are beyond our control. I, I think uh, the older I get, the more I've learned to let go, and things happen when they're meant to happen. I always believed in the visit. The visit is, is almost 15 years from its royal premiere in Chicago. And then about seven or eight years after that, there was a second production at the Signature Theater in, outside of DC in Arlington. And then this production from Williamstown. And I always had faith this show would eventually come to New York. I think it's a wonderful show and it just, the time wasn't right, I guess. I didn't drive myself crazy. I can't make a show happen. A lot of things have to align, and they just aligned this time. And, you know, it's it's a wonderful role for Cheetah. And, and uh, we used to joke 15 years ago, age is on our side. The older you are for this part, the better. Now we joke, no, that's not true anymore. <laughs> so uh, she's ready to do it. Uh, and uh, it's just going to be glorious. But we didn't drive ourselves crazy. There was a, a trust. I, th I think good work eventually gets done. Um, you have to have advocates for it. Uh, I mean, a play, if it just languishes in a drawer, no one's going to do it. But um, that show had enough exposure. People had seen it and thought it, believed in it. Um, I think it's, it's the last score John and Fred wrote Candor and Ebb, and I think it's really one of their best scores. It's so unlike any their other shows that I think it's going to surprise people. There's numbers in it. That if you didn't know who wrote the words and music, I don't think you'd say, oh, that's a Candor Ebb number. Uh, and we found the right director for it and choreographer, uh, John Doyle and Graziel Danielle have just that kind of seamless thing. I used to read about that, uh, I guess, um, Josh Logan had with Agnes DeMille, say, or you know, just seamless. It's got like one person directed and choreographed it. It's just wonderful. It's very, there's a lot of movement in the piece. There's not number numbers, but it's very choreographed too, very stylized. And it was just their collaboration was a beautiful thing to watch. And Cheetah and Roger Reese together are very special. And I don't know whose name it was. Who it was at a table at uh, lunch saying, who can we get to play opposite Cheetah? Who came up with Rogers? And he's, he's a revelation in the part. And uh, I can't take credit for that. And uh, that's what's exciting about the theater. There's always the unexpected thing happens. Uh, that is also the source of a lot of the frustration about theater. Because it's, it's not a good industry, career, way of life for a control freak. And yet there are a lot of a lot of control freaks who end up in the theater, but I think they are 
usually broken <laughs> pretty thoroughly and soon, but you know, I mean, you could say, what's the biggest control freak of all if you can play right? You're dictating, she lives, she dies, he gets married, he falls down the stairs, he inherits a million dollars, but I've learned, you know, to let go. And, uh, and I, I, I just, I think you do acquire a certain wisdom about theater the older you get, but it's, I love the impatience of young people and I still have my youthful impatience. I want it to happen now, I want it to be good. They did it so right Friday. Why does the Saturday matinee suck? You know, it's, why can't you bottle the lightning? But then there's nights the show, you say, I'll never see a better performance of The Visit than that. This is the one that should be filmed for the history books. Then you go three nights later and it's even better. Magically, the actors find even greater heights to rise to. So it's, it's exhilarating. I mean, I, I, I often say having a life in the theater such as I've had is, is its own reward. Um, I know we all have to eat and uh, have a roof over our heads, but other than that, if you can do theater and not starve to death and not shiver in the a cold night because you're sleeping in the park, I think you've got to consider yourself well paid because it's, it's an amazing life. Um, and there are times I lived in apartments, my mother would literally burst into tears. I don't know how you can live like this. And I thought, I, I thought I'm so lucky to be living in Manhattan because <laughs> these were still the days when you could live in Manhattan now, all the young people, they all live in Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island even, the Bronx. I mean, there's no real estate for young people. That's had a huge impact on the arts in this city, that it's so difficult for young people to come here and, and be artists. Uh, when you talk about the visit a little bit and uh, your excitement about that, tell me a little bit about the difference between writing a play and writing a book for a musical. Um, for me, uh, the biggest difference is that a musical, I am a collaborator, and the musical should seem as if one person, one mind, one sensibility wrote the book, the music, and the lyrics. So there's not a big disconnect from the dialogue to the music or the words. The lyrics don't remotely sound like the character we've lived in, listened to speaking. So it's finding the right collaborators and it's being willing to really uh, say your main job is to provide the structure for the show. And if you write a really good scene and the actors and the, your composer, lyricist, collaborators come up with a really good song that accomplishes exactly what that scene did, you have to be glad for them and let your scene go. It's, it's not, if you've got a big, needy ego, you're not going to be happy writing the book for a musical. I, I think it's more like the, someone who plays in line on a football team. You know, the quarterbacks get all the glory and the running ends, the running backs. And that's the composer and lyricist. Uh, but you have to take pride in your work and that you've done a good job. But you're not the star of the evening. I'm the star of my plays. I'm not the star of my musicals. And uh, I love musicals enough because that's what probably got me, that's what drew me to the theater as a child, certainly. Chekhov or, or Beck, Samuel Beckett didn't, it was musicals. And I think you know, but I think a lot of my friends who have taken the playwright friends who have taken a crack at writing the book, they treat it a little bit like playwright light, and it's not. It's very hard work. You have to give it the same attention to detail and craft that you do to a play of your own. But it's just your ego is going to be a little battered when your favorite line or two gets swallowed up by a song, and they may be. There's whole sentences of mine that are in some of my collaborators' lyrics, and I'm honored um, when I... It, listen, it's a bad book. If, if you've written a, a five-page scene for two characters, three characters, and your collaborators read it, say, we don't see a song in the, what you've given us, then you failed as a book writer. And I, 
uh, as far as my own writing, I probably tend to overwrite the first draft of a musical a bit to give them a lot of ideas of what I think they can musicalize or get ideas for lyrics, images that maybe the lyricists will respond to. But I've been really lucky with who I've worked with on, on musicals for the most part. I would say your choice of collaborators on a musical is as important as choosing uh, a, a life partner, a spouse. Because you're with these people a lot, you have to completely trust them, you have to really look out for one another, and it's it's tough love a lot, but I, I really have worked with wonderful, wonderful people, and I think some people uh, have been unhappy working on musicals because it hasn't been the right people in the room. And unless you have the right people in the room, you're kind of doomed. And uh, I've been involved in projects like that too, like we're all sitting here because we've all won some awards and we have a bit of a high profile, but do we really see eye to eye on, on this project? No. And those projects usually go nowhere. So choose well. If you're going to do a musical, and it's got to be the right, I think uh, one of the problems with musicals today is um, people are choosing material that isn't strong enough to sustain two and a half hours of song. And at the end of the first act, there's sort of, there's not enough plot and stuff going. And uh, musicals, you know, the musicals, most of the ones I've done have been successful have been big emotional stories like Ragtime or Kiss of the Spider Woman. And uh, even um, the Full Monty is a, there's a lot of meat in the, in the Full Monty. Uh, I've seen shows where they, they kind of run out of gas very quickly because the story is, a, the situation isn't strong enough. And uh, it's, you know, listen, when I told people I was doing Ragtime, or Spider Woman, because that's the worst idea I've ever heard for a musical. If someone said I'm making a musical of Pygmalion, I would have said that's the worst idea I've ever heard. So you find people who see, you all agree, yeah, let's make a musical out of Crap's last tape, and you'll probably make a good one if you all passionately want to make that musical and see eye to eye on it and believe in it. Obviously, the industry, some things about the industry have changed a lot over your, what I now know is 50 years on Broadway you're celebrating now, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, you talk about ticket prices from a dollar when you saw My Fair Lady to now, obviously. Some things haven't changed. There are still people coming to New York waiting in line for tickets for yeah. the hottest show. Tell me, how do you think producers have changed over the last 50 years, or have they changed? Have you, is there any difference you see in the people that work with that option your shows now? And yeah, I, 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 the biggest change I've seen, uh, when I first came to New York, producing was very much a mom and pop kind of thing. You would say David Merrick presents, Robert Whitehead presents, um, Kermit Bloom Garden presents, Roger, St Roger L. Stevens. Now there's anywhere from 10 to 30 to 40 names above a title present. So it's it was one man. And, I remember people who would say, oh, I'll see any show Robert Whitehead produces or Kermit Bloomgarden, because they only do classy plays. So if, it's, if he thinks this is a good new American play or play worth bringing from London, I, they were like stars, the producers. You went to see uh, a David Merrick promise showmanship, uh, you know, more likely you're going to see a big commercial hit. But they were, they were as big a star as the stars they were presenting. Their names were everywhere. You know, everything had Robert Whitehead presents, so and so presents. That's changed. Also, we've had the big in taking over the role for more serious plays as production costs cost got so high at the not for profit theaters like Manhattan Theater Club, Playwrights Horizon, and um, the, those are institutions you're working for. And I spent a good 10 or so, 10 to 15 years at Manhattan Theater Club. So I sort of had a big disconnect from, quote, the commercial theater during all those years I worked only at Manhattan Theater Club, where I wrote some of my most known plays, like Frankie and Johnny, Lisbon Traviata, Lips Together, Teeth Apart, The Perfect Ganesh, uh, quite a few of them. And uh, so now that I sort of back on Broadway, in a way, what I've noticed is 
much it's much more by committee. Uh, I think things move at a more glacial pace. Um, also, what people want from a success now has changed so much. Uh, a show was a hit and ran a year. Now these theaters are being held hostage by shows that are into their 10th, their 15th, approaching their 20th year. So the number of Broadway theaters has decreased almost by half. Now that they've been torn down, that just those theaters are, for the foreseeable future, not available to anyone. So that's a huge, if you look back at the, the historic great shows of Broadway, most of them ran three, three to 400 performances. And then My Fair Lady was like, I think it ran 750. That would be nothing now, I mean. So that's a, a big change. Uh, I, I don't remember as many revivals when I was younger, but there seemed to be many more well-known American playwrights, not just Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller and William Inge. A lot of people whose names are not as familiar. Now Lillian Hellman was very active when I first came here. But the uh, revival, I don't remember seeing occasionally there'd be a Shaw play on Broadway. But those weren't like Shaw plays. Those, uh, those weren't like revivals. That was like, oh, we've got some great British actors to show us how to do Bernard Shaw or Shakespeare. Um, but the amount of revivals is, is a very significant change. We also had uh, theater stars that just had earned the respect and trust of an audience. Uh, they didn't have to make big hit movies, you know, to come to be on Broadway. And people like Maureen Stapleton, Kim Stanley, Geraldine Page were really theater stars. Ethel Merman, Mary Martin. We, it's that's little different, the phenomenon of a, of a, say, um, what's happening with the elephant man. That, that was, that didn't happen then. A, a movie star, a wonderful actor, but the, the, I don't remember that happening. And now that's very common for a Tom Hanks or Bradley Cooper to come and do a play for a limited season. That's another big change, the limited season. I mean, every play used to say, we're open, we hope to run as long as people want to buy tickets. And now it's very common positively 16 weeks. And uh, that's why you want a star that will sort of sell you out before you open. So that's another change, but still, I mean, uh, this curtain goes up and there's that wonderful dialogue between stage and audience, or there's not, and that has not changed. And it's not based on how much money you spend or what you pay for your, you know, I've seen very minimal shows with unstarry actors that have had the audience absolutely galvanized and I've seen big over bloated productions with lots of famous people running around and fabulous sets and costumes and the chemistry between stage and audience didn't happen which is always you know that lightning we keep trying to bottle but I, I think the theater is harder now um, riskier for producers I think it's harder for young playwrights to get established um, I just think everything is harder. They keep putting more obstacles in everybody's way, but it still doesn't stop the people who believe in this art form, which is, you know, some people feel like with the invention of film, there is no longer a need for theater when you can get the ideal cast, film it. It doesn't change. You can show it anywhere that you have electricity and a screen. Why bother to make it happen live eight shows a week? And there's other people who think there's nothing more exciting that this one night, this performance of It's Only a Play or Hamlet will be unlike the performance they gave the night before and the one they're going to give tomorrow night. And you have to be there to see that particular night. And I'm one of those people who, I, I think theater, people are stage struck and I think people still come are people, kids loved going to camp and sitting around the campfire and the counselor would tell us a really good story and you ooh ah, because we're still sitting in a dark room with light, with light on and someone telling us a story and, and you either, it makes you stop breathing or your heart race faster or laugh or it's boring and you, your mind wanders and that's the trick, <laughs> keep their, their attention, the audience's attention 
and trust and affection and the rewards are enormous emotionally and they can be financially too. It's just hard. Uh, but I don't think theater was ever easy. Shakespeare's plays are filled with references to how hard it is, you know, the theater next door has bear baiting and they're selling many more tickets than his theater, which is doing high tone drama and tragedy. So I don't think it's ever been easy. And the, you've worked obviously with a lot of different producers mm -hmm. over the years. I won't ask you to name your favorite or your least favorite unless you want to. Um, but <laughs> the characteristics that you think make up a successful producer, what, what do you look for? When you when someone says I want to I want to option your work, what's what makes up a great producer today? Uh, I would think I'm pausing because I've worked with so few individual producers. Uh, you know, my first play was produced by Ted Mann, um, the one that started at the Guthrie Theater, and he was very. It was just Ted Mann, uh, and then suddenly, I don't. Suddenly, there were, now there are many producers to deal with. Uh, well, I, I dealt with a very famous, the last of kind of the really uh, theatrical producers who was very famous at the time, Garth Drabinsky, who, you know, got into a lot of trouble with the law. But Garth was very mom and pop. This is my play. I have an opinion about absolutely everything that goes on. The sets, the costumes, the lighting, that line, uh, and I like that. I much prefer a producer who is there and engages in what he's producing as opposed to I'm just worried what the audience is going to think and I'm... I can tell you the kind of producer I don't want to work with. I worked on a show at the Guthrie... at the Globe Theater, Old Globe in San Diego. I wouldn't say which show, I eventually got to Broadway. And I was in a stall in the men's room and uh, it was sort of between shows. And I was aware two people, you know, after all, there were other people, at, not in stalls, but at the urinals. And I heard a very familiar voice, being the producer, saying, so, what did you think of the show? And this customer said, I basically liked it. I didn't like the scene where da-da-da-da-da-da. And the guy said, very interesting, thank you. So, the, I, two flushes after a while, I said, I'll wait about five minutes. So I go out in the lobby, and there's a producer sitting there. Terrence, been meaning to talk to you. You know what scene never has really worked for me? And word for word, he quoted what this total stranger had said to him five minutes earlier in the men's room. That's the kind of producer I don't want to work with. And there are a lot, and that is very typical. I'm sorry to say. I've been stifling uh, my laughter here for the last couple of minutes that, so Terrence could get that out because that's a fantastic story. I, I also don't like working with producers who are unable to raise a penny and I have dealt with, for all of their intelligence and charm, they are unable to do that part of it, which is important too. But I think you need to, I, I think, you know, in the theater the tradition is if a playwright has notes, you give them to the director, not to the actors. There's one boss, and it can only be one voice, I think, representing the producer. So in this day and age, when there are 40 names above the title, and people come up to me and say, I'm one of your producers, and I didn't like this line, I say, uh, tell the lead producer that. I take notes from him. I can't take notes from anybody else because theater could become chaos so quickly. Everyone is fighting desperately to do the right, what's right for this play or musical. To have people all over picking at it, it just, I've learned the hard way. There's times I want to say to an actor uh, something, but no. You wait and go to the director and say, would you please tell? Or I think the reason that's not working, whatever. But. So I think a producer, it's the ultimate mom and pop job still left in the 21st century when everything is so corporate. Uh, here's a chance for an individual to really believe in something and present in collaboration with other people his vision. But it can't be a group. Theater is not by committee. And I think it's, it is 
he was perhaps threatening a bit to get that way. And, uh, you know, I'm not big on audience polls and interviews. And I mean, during Ragtime, we, uh, the producer, Garth Trubinsky, wanted us to go to a uh, market research and we were watching the audience through a one-way mirror. And I felt it was like a crime movie. And I think it's terrible people being eavesdropped on and they don't know we're behind the wall. And he said, uh, and so, so what the, the interviewer said, what did you think uh, of the title? So I said, I didn't like the title. And, and I said, why? I said, well, I think Charleston would have been better. In fact, I thought the whole show, I just thought there'd be a lot more of Charleston routines. And I mean, that's like so stupid. And you're paying money to, you're paying good money to hear these stupid opinions like the Charleston was developed about 25 years after Ragtime. <laughs> I love it. I can see and it now. Like, why, are, why are you spending your money on this, you know? Uh, yeah, you know, that's why I say work with smart people who know that Ragtime is, <laughs> you know, before 1920s. <laughs> Terrence McNally's next play will take place in a focus group, market read behind closed uh, a, a glass partition. Um, I have one more question for you. Uh, if you could wake up tomorrow and uh, someone gave you a magic wand and they said, Terrence, you can wave this wand and change one thing about Broadway today. One thing you can change it. Now, I ask this question of everybody. Mm -hmm. I get very different responses. You can change one thing, but one thing only. What would that one thing be? The price of tickets. No hesitation. Be less money in my pocket, but they bring more bums and seats, as the Brits say. And uh, that's the goal. We do this to communicate. And the more people that see my plays, the more people I've had a chance to talk to. I think we'd all love those ticket prices to come down. And I think every one of us who got into this business for the right reasons would be happy to take some money out of our pockets in order to get more people to experience what we experience every day. Uh, I want to thank Terrence for taking the time out of his very busy day. In fact, listeners, I will tell you, he literally said, I'm on deadline for tomorrow morning. I'll squeeze you in on Sunday night when we're doing this. Um, so I want to thank him for offering his uh, perspective. Uh, and just to say on the record, literally, uh, on this recording, to say how thankful all of us are uh, for your dedication to Broadway and the theater. Broadway and the world, frankly, is just a better place because of you and your plays. Thank you. It's very generous. So that's it for episode four of the Producer's Perspective podcast. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss our next episode, which will feature none other than Broadway advertising and marketing guru Drew Hodges, the founder of Spotco Advertising. I'll be sure to find out what he thinks about Marcus research, uh, market research and whether he agrees with Terrence. Um, he'll talk about the secrets to selling a show. So tune in next Monday. Until then, I'm Ken Davenport, and this is the Producer's Perspective podcast. <laughs>